Today, we'll be discussing a case that illustrates some fundamental principles of host microbe interaction. When this 20 year old athlete became the host for a highly virulent form of bacteria, the result was a painful reminder of the immune system's ability to wall off infection. Kaho was a 20 year old man, originally from Tonga, who was now playing college football in the US. While traveling with his team for a series of away games, Kaho began to experience redness and pain on his right shoulder. Although he plays a vigorous contact sport, he didn't remember any particular injury to that area. Over the following day, his shoulder became increasingly red, warm, and exquisitely painful. Kaho was taken by his athletic trainer to a local acute care clinic, where he was noted to be well-appearing, a large muscular man with no fever and normal vital signs. On physical exam, the physician observed a three centimeter area consisting of a central pustule surrounded by a red, swollen rim. The area was warm and tender, and the lesion was producing a small amount of cloudy discharge. When the physician applied gentle pressure to the area, she felt a give, suggesting a collection of fluid in the soft tissue underneath the skin. The redness did not appear to spread beyond the immediate area of the lesion. Kaho's lymph nodes in the area were normal, as was the remainder of his physical exam. The physician explained to Kaho that he appeared to have an abscess and that to treat it, she would need to open the skin to allow the collection of pus to drain. The process leading to Kaho's abscess had most likely begun a few days earlier when a microscopic break occurred in the skin barrier that usually protects the host from bacterial entry. This may have happened due to trauma that occurred during a normal football practice, allowing bacteria which had colonized the skin surface to penetrate the skin and enter the subcutaneous tissues. There, the bacteria produced toxins which killed nearby cells in the soft tissue. Kaho's dying cells released many signaling molecules, inducing the activation of the innate immune system to deploy an army of neutrophils to the site of infection. The neutrophils secreted enzymes to digest the dead cells, as shown in this scanning electron micrograph of a human neutrophil ingesting the very same microbe that caused Kaho's abscess. Within hours, a microscopic fluid-filled cavity had formed within Kaho's subcutaneous tissue. This fluid, rich in cell debris and neutrophils and bacteria, is what we know as pus. Over the next two to three days, the battle between bacteria and neutrophils continued, and the cavity grew larger. Meanwhile, local fibroblasts formed a layer of granulation tissue and a thick layer of collagen-rich tissue around the pus-filled cavity, walling off the cavity and the bacteria inside. This walling off function of the host immune response is life-saving because it effectively prevents the bacteria from spreading to the rest of Kaho's body. This is why he didn't experience any systemic signs of illness like fever. But in this case, Kaho's immune system was unable to completely eliminate the bacteria. So the battle continued and the abscess expanded, causing Kaho's progressively worsening localized symptoms. After an abscess has formed, antibiotic medications can't easily penetrate the pyogenic membrane to kill the bacteria, so the pus inside the abscess has to be drained, either spontaneously or by a medical procedure in order for the patient to heal. In the clinic, the physician washed the affected area with disinfectant soap and used a needle and syringe to obtain a sample of the pus inside. The physician then made an incision into the area where she had felt the fluid collection. She thoroughly cleaned and explored the area of incision to make sure there were no pockets of pus that she had missed. She then packed the wound with a small piece of gauze to keep it open so it would continue to drain, and she applied antibiotic ointment. She explained to Kaho and his trainer how to care for the wound by gently cleaning it with soap and water and regularly changing the dressings. 
the physician then considered whether she should prescribe oral antibiotics to Kaho. She knew that oral antibiotics alone could not have penetrated the intact abscess, but after incision and drainage, antibiotics can sometimes be helpful. She took into account that Kaho had only a single small lesion, and the redness and warmth didn't appear to extend beyond the immediate area. He had no other known medical conditions, was not immunosuppressed, and had no fever or other signs of systemic infection. Because of Kaho's high body mass index and Pacific Islander heritage, the physician did worry that he was at risk for diabetes, which can lead to more severe skin infections and poor wound healing. Fortunately, Kaho's hemoglobin A1c measured in the clinic was normal, ruling out diabetes. Overall, the physician concluded that Kaho had an uncomplicated abscess and she decided not to prescribe oral antibiotics. The fluid collection in the syringe from Kaho's abscess was sent to the microbiology lab for analysis. Gram stain of the fluid revealed numerous neutrophils and gram-positive coccyan clusters. The bacterial culture revealed yellowish colonies with beta hemolysis on sheep blood agar. Antibiotic susceptibility testing revealed that bacterial colonies grew normally in the presence of several beta-lactam antibiotics in the culture dish, but the bacterial growth was inhibited by two other antibiotics, clindamycin and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Together, these lab tests confirmed a diagnosis of community-acquired methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Methicillin-resistant Staph aureus is an example of how bacteria can evolve in the presence of antibiotics to develop resistance. Penicillin and other antibiotics of the beta-lactam family work by binding to penicillin binding proteins, bacterial proteins which are essential for maintaining the bacterial cell wall. But these bacterial proteins can evolve their structure so that they're no longer efficiently bound by beta-lactam antibiotics. In the case of MRSA, a gene called MECA encodes a particular form of penicillin binding protein, PBP2A, which allows the bacteria to grow and divide in the presence of most beta-lactam antibiotics. MEC-A isn't located on the bacterial chromosome. It's located on a mobile genetic element called the staphylococcal chromosome cassette, or scc mec This cassette can be passed directly from one bacterium to another through horizontal gene transfer, which allows the population of bacteria to develop antibiotic resistance even more rapidly. MRSA first emerged in healthcare settings in the 1960s, almost immediately after the development of methicillin and related antibiotics. But in the 1980s, MRSA also began appearing in young, otherwise healthy patients like Kaho, who had no recent exposure to healthcare settings. This new community-acquired MRSA strain was especially virulent because it had gained the ability to produce a cytotoxin, which forms pores in the membrane of infected cells, causing widespread necrosis. The gene for this pore-forming cytotoxin is also not located on the bacterial chromosome. Instead, it's carried on a bacteriophage virus, which infects Staph aureus, another way in which a powerful virulence factor can establish itself widely and rapidly in the Staph aureus population. The physician called Kaho to inform him that community-acquired MRSA had been identified as the cause of his abscess. After learning that Kaho's infection was caused by this virulent pathogen, the team athletic trainer researched how he could help prevent the spread of infection among Kaho's teammates. He learned the importance of not sharing items which may become contaminated with wound drainage, such as towels, clothing, bedding, bar soap, or razors. And he also disinfected the surfaces in the athletic training room and in the locker rooms. Kaho faithfully cleaned the incision and changed his dressings twice a day. The redness, swelling, and pain resolved within two days, and within several days, the wound had healed, and Kaho could return to full participation in practice and games with his team.